I'm, first of all, I'm excited to be here, and I hope that uh, what I say, uh, what I leave you with is something that you can find practical, and maybe we can implement some of these things. But I do want to share this with my background. Uh, I am a publisher of the newspaper called the Ohio Life News. It's also found online. And I left some copies back on the table there for you. I'm here with my lovely wife, Lori, who is also a member of our show. We have, uh, one, she's one of the co-hosts of the Jeff, Lori, and Nick show, which is a conservative uh, radio talk show, which we're found on iHeartRadio and other platforms. Um, also, I need to share with you uh, much was said about my Democratic Party affiliation previously. Uh, when I did come to see the light, um, and find that a lot of the policies just did not work. Um, I did switch parties and I am on the executive committee of the largest county's Republican Party in Ohio, which is Cuyahoga County. Um, also, I'm the owner of, our, our family's been in the publishing business, marketing and PR since 1950, and I own a marketing and public relations firm uh, for the last almost 20 years, and that's. Uh, We've helped hundreds of candidates, issues, and businesses uh, get their message out and get more customers and uh, get more publicity. Uh, the other thing is uh, I must give recognition to uh, our members. Uh, I pre I'm president of the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance of Ohio, and uh, we uh, are doing a number of things. So, First of all, uh, thank you again, Lori. Um, dealing with MLK and Zionism, Dr. King, I would like to say, was, of course, known as a real fighter for civil rights, and he was also a fighter for the Jews. Now, sadly, in today's world, uh, much anti-Semitism comes from civil rights leaders and uh, leaders and activists uh, that have continued uh, fighting along those lines, and even and sadly to say, even in the uh, African American community, you know, they, a lot of the leaders have fought, forgotten how much Dr. King loved the Jewish people and they loved him. The scripture always just comes to mind. Uh, what greater love hath any man than that he laid his life down for his brother? Dr. King had that type of relationship with the Jewish commun community. So the, the topic, Martin Luther King and Zionism, specifically Zionism. It's one thing to love. And my sister here talked about um, social justice. It's love everybody. And liberalism loves everybody. It's just about love everything and everybody, even things that are wrong. So, but Zionism, Dr. King um, said his dream, of course, of, of a post-racial society where people would be judged by the content of their character instead of the color of their skin. With, as it relates to Zionism, Dr. King made this statement. He said, when people criticize Zionists, they mean Jews. You're talking anti-Semitism. Those are two powerful sentences that Dr. King made. In other words, just think about that. When people criticize Zionists, they mean Jews. You're talking anti-Semitism. Those two um, sentences there really, really sum up his profound and unequivocal support for the nation of Israel. And that's where we are today. So Martin Luther King was, support, did support Zionism. Um, he loved Israel. And we look, we, so we talk about the rise of anti-Semitism in the Christian African, African-American community. Well, let's look back. Um, when you look at the history of uh, blacks and Jews, and especially in New York City over the last half century, it's been a very complex uh, relationship. It's been somewhat complicated. And while you may, it might seem as though these two communities, uh, minority communities that were natural allies in the struggle for civil rights, because as we all know, there were Jews who, who marched and rabbis right alongside Dr. King during the 60s. Oh, with that great, you look at the old, that, that great speech of, uh, we have a dream, I have a dream. Who was there? 
with Dr. King. Jews, rabbis, hold it hand in hand. So this relationship has been somewhat complicated. How could it even um, come to this point now where it is today in New York City? That's just, as we just look at New York City. Well, it seems as though during the 1960s, um, these two allies found themselves on different sides of the struggle as it relates to the different issues, minor issues that, it, that um, sprung up during the 1960s. Conflicts over housing, the education system. Um, and, and it seemed as though Jews did leave some of those areas of the inner cities. And what happened, it left a void for other communities and, um, to come in and whereas there were, this is a problem here even today, where there were many Jewish businesses in the inner cities. Uh, after they left, went to suburbs and so forth, it left a lot of vacant properties, a lot of vacant businesses. And what happened were you, a lot of uh, Arab owned businesses came in, which is the issue today. And it led to, Here's the other thing. You have Arab grocers, uh, gas station owners, and other businesses. And also you had a lot, today there, you have a lot of Asian businesses that have uh, taken up residence in inner cities. So what happens is you lose that personal uh, touch and you don't have that face-to-face -face contact anymore that Jews had with uh, African Americans during the 60s and during the civil rights era where they were marching hand in hand. They just don't see each other daily. And I'm reminded of a friend who said this to me and it was very profound and it just kind of stuck with me. He said, you know what, it's hard to hate up close. So that's gonna lead to the three questions that uh, uh, were asked. Uh, so these, what happened was when these conflicts over housing and education and other smaller issues uh, developed in the 60s and, and, and all the uh, protesting and marching and so forth that took place after Dr. King, it seemed as though Jews and African Americans found themselves on different sides especially as it related to economic issues. Remember, a lot of the Jews that owned the businesses continued to own their businesses, but they moved their businesses. So then a lot of African Americans did not have that uh, same mindset to own their businesses as in Greenwood uh, in South Carolina and so forth, and Tulsa, Oklahoma, where, there were, which, where we had these great models of uh, Black Wall Street. So. Here we have the tensions today, uh, tensions developed in New York between poor blacks, ultra-Orthodox Jews, and, and again, uh, what happened was it created misunderstandings between blacks and Jews on both sides. And then during the Crown Heights riots of 1991 where you had activists um, like Al Sharpton, for instance, took different positions and said different things. It kind of helped to incite uh, problems and divisions. And then that coupled with the identity politics that it seemed to, uh, that, that it gave rise to more identity politics with, which, which really helped to create walls between people, build walls and show the, and highlight differences between people. When in reality, we're all God's children. We're all one, one nation, and we, we should all seek um, to, to find common ground and love. Okay, so um, and today, it leads to today where surveys have shown that over the last quarter century, last quarter century, African Americans hold anti-Semitic views at a rate far higher than the rest of the population, and it's due to the lack of communication. Add this uh, to the Nation of Islam and its rhetoric, okay? Um, and then actual mosques 
being in black inner city communities. It's just somewhat softens, um, softens the walls of separation between the two groups. Um, now I'm speaking the two groups, African Americans and Muslims, because they have their mosques in inner city communities. So, and they try to meet, uh, they attempt to meet with other African American clergy and, and, and shed their uh, positions. Okay, so it kind of softens the relationships, at least it, it creates some dialogue, even though um, black Christians, Christian leaders, are very proud of their Judeo-Christian heritage and hold to it because of the biblical truths where God told us in the book of Genesis that I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you, and God's chosen people are not forgotten, but we were in, engrafted through Jesus Christ to be accepted into the vine, the true vine. So we're all God's people and we're all called by Jesus Christ into the family of God, okay? Jew, whether Jew or Gentile. And then the three, so um, also you add to this liberalism. We talked about uh, the 60s and 70s, we saw the lack of businesses, Jewish businesses, uh, leaving African American communities and in inner cities. Um, Arab grocers in many inner city communities, they hired regular folks. And when they hire family members of African Americans, that creates relationships. And, 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 and you talk to Arabs and you talk to other, um, even Asians. So my point is, when you don't have the Jewish businesses there, that also uh, led to some, demi some uh, lack of uh, uh, relationships, some led to the destruction of them. So then, um, this also the social justice and liberalism versus God's standard. How do we overcome? And I'm going to wrap this up. Um, and there is reason for optimism. How do, it's number one, we wrap this, we, we overcome this by bringing people together, bringing leaders together, people of faith, faith leaders for the purposes of information, uh, discussion. That's the first thing, you've got to talk. Jewish leaders, African American leaders have to come together and talk. Uh, secondly, I, I really believe we can overcome this through economic engagement. Um, I find that as, conserv as a conservative, African-American males are more uh, apt to listen to a message, a conservative message, when it has to do with building them up, giving them a sense of self-worth and freedom and economic empowerment. And I really believe that economic engagement in, can be done through business coaching, um, an empowerment series, uh, speaking of economic empowerment and building up your own communities, taking control of your businesses in black communities. And I think that um, African American and Jews can collaborate and come up with, create these type of series that will, um, that are beneficial to both. And while that's being done, of course, that's creating long lasting uh, friendships and it's engagement that's ongoing as opposed to a simple seminar or a one-day activity. And these are the type of things that we're going to put, push forward. Also, um, thirdly, educate. Back to the basics of scripture. Our, uh, educate African Americans about their God-given responsibility to embrace Israel God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. Uh, and how do we do that? Through social media, um, through television, radio, um, and through, our, through a free press. And we utilize our newspaper, both hard copies and online, Ohio Life, Ohio and Midwest Life News. Um, you can look at our newspaper online, ohiolifenews.com. You can Google Jeff, Lori, and Nick show. We interviewed Lori Cordoza Moore, and also we're going to continue to promote um, the belief 
our position with Israel and that we believe that all people, all Christians, African Americans must uh, do their part to uh, extend an arm and a hand to build this relationship.